Hi there, this is uh, Carl Irwin with a uh, Linux Multimedia Studio uh, tutorial. Uh, I wanted to look at a few uh, things here that are kind of new. This is um, the uh, 1.2 Release Candidate 5 version of Linux Multimedia Studio, uh, and I'm using the uh, App Image um, release on a Linux system. Uh, they're still testing a few things on it. I just wanted to look at some of the uh, minor updates that are on here, uh, and I wanted to talk a bit about uh, using it as a, um, a fully-fledged, legitimate uh, MIDI sequencer for uh, orchestration and mock-ups. Uh, so before we get into that, though, I wanted to uh, share with you a, a, my collection of sound fonts. Um, I've put these together over the years. Uh, on a previous tutorial, I, I showed you a place where you could go download a bunch of sound fonts. Um, this includes um, essentially all of those sound fonts and then a few others that I've collected over the years. Uh, and they've been organized uh, uh, as follows. You can see here I have uh, folders. Uh, and the folders are broken up into different uh, sections or different parts of a kind of a symphonic uh, sort of setting. Uh, so I have a folder for brass instruments, so I have some accent brass sounds, some horn sounds, low brass sounds, which would be trombone and tuba, and then trumpet uh, sounds. And what I've done is I've compiled together uh, the best individual instrument uh, sound fonts, or the, the best samples from different sound fonts, into um, sp instrument-specific sound fonts. So uh, if you were to look inside of each one of these, and we'll look at that in a minute, you would find that uh, each sound font has uh, multiple samples, multiple uh, different instrument samples that you can choose from. Uh, and this makes it very easy then to use in a, a sequencer kind of setting where you could uh, uh, patch change very quickly from one instrument to another or, or just navigate very quickly. Uh, you can duplicate an instrument uh, and then uh, select multiple layers of that one instrument to put together to make the instrument sound more realistic. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. A minute. But uh, I just wanted to uh, share this with you. Uh, a quick rundown of uh, some of the um, sound fonts that are part of this uh, collection that's been reorganized. I'm using um, uh, a couple of general MIDI uh, sound fonts, uh, the Fluid R3 uh, sound font and the uh, Tim GM6 from uh, the MuseScore package is in here. These are open source sound fonts. They're general MIDI sound fonts. They're not very realistic, but they're a good reference, so I included them in there. Um, uh, I'm also using, in, in all of these uh, different categories, uh, the following ensemble sound fonts. So the St. James Orchestra, uh, the Sonatina sound font, Squid Font Orchestra, uh, Cadenza Strings, Haiti Strings, uh, some of the uh, University of Iowa uh, sampled sound fonts that are, are out there, and a, a variety that uh, you can find on uh, places like the uh, Hammer Sound uh, website. Uh, so a lot of these different sound fonts that you probably are already familiar with, but they've just been collected and compiled uh, and patched together. Now all of the metadata, uh, to the best of my recollection, all of the metadata from all of those sound fonts is still present in each one of these collections, uh, so the, the, the sourcing is there if you were to take a look at it and open it up into a sound font editor, you would see all of that original metadata and uh, sourcing. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to share this. Uh, a link for this will be in uh, the description for this video. Uh, it's a sizable um, download. It's, it's over a gig, so uh, it's not quite as big as uh, the whole collection that you would find on that Newgrounds website uh, forum uh, that I alluded to in previous tutorials. Um, but it's really kind of what I consider the best of the best. So, uh, you know, just over a gig in samples. And I think that with these uh, samples, you can create um, completely convincing mock-ups if you put the time in. So I'm sharing it with you, and we'll talk a little bit about how to use this in a minute. Uh, the next thing I wanted to talk about was uh, the features of this uh, uh, current uh, release candidate of Linux Multimedia Studio. Uh, first of all, the uh, user interface looks a lot better. It is uh, a little bit more monochromatic in terms of the um, uh, window dressing uh, that you find on it, which is nice because the previous versions uh, were a little bit harder on the eye. Some of the color palettes didn't really line up. 
um, but this does a much better job at um, uh, uh, fixing that. Uh, also, uh, a couple of other improvements in here is that the button design is a little bit more uniform. Uh, the graphics are much improved. Again, kind of a monocratic, monochromatic white on gray sort of uh, imagery. Uh, a little bit easier on the eyes, a little bit easier to see and navigate around. So that's much improved. Um, the functions, uh, there's a few functions that are much improved. There's one really, really big one. Uh, and uh, for me anyway, and that is the clone function. It used to be that when you were to clone a track, it would put the cloned track all the way at the bottom, and then you would ha have to move it where you wanted it to be. Um, <clears throat> now the clone track is replicated immediately below the original. So that's a big, big, big benefit in terms of organization, uh, something that I found very useful. Um, Linux Multimedia Studio is a fully featured MIDI sequencer. I think that that gets shortchanged, that fact. Um, you know, people don't really think of it as being used that way, but it is uh, really uh, just as good, if not better in a lot of ways, than some of the other uh, uh, sequencers that you find, particularly on Linux. Um, it's adequate for orchestral mock-ups. Uh, it can also incorporate audio uh, in one of two ways. Uh, you can use uh, a sample track. Uh, if you add a sample track on there, you can add a, a large sample. You can also add on a, an audio file processor, uh, which is another way to add audio in there. Now, it doesn't edit that audio very well, but you can certainly incorporate audio elements uh, into your sequence, just like you can in any other fully-fledged uh, MIDI sequencer. Um, for its lack of luxury features, uh, it is very well organized and intuitive. The inputs and outputs are automatic and logical. And Linux Multimedia Studio, as far as its sequencing capability, you do not need to spend a lot of time um, setting your inputs and outputs and messing around with your effects mixer and getting things to route to the proper place. In fact, you don't really do that at all. Everything routes automatically to uh, the effects mixer, to the master, uh, and you merely have to change, uh, for example, on this instrument right here, you just need to change uh, an effects track. If you want to add a track, uh, an effects track to mix down uh, in the intermediate, uh, you can set that and then set, set your effects track, and it will mix down to that and then go to the master. It's, it's automatic. Everything, everything automatically plugs into where it's supposed to be when you create um, uh, instruments and new tracks. So a couple of lacking features, uh, I think, that are, are worth pointing out. Linux Multimedia Studio does not have a uh, MIDI timecode output or input, and that creates a problem in terms of uh, setting up sync and slave master kinds of relationships with other pieces of software. Uh, it doesn't do that very well with respect to MIDI timecode and syncing. In fact, it doesn't do it at all. Now you can uh, use it as a slave or master in terms of MIDI input and output, but it will not sync to timecode. Uh, so that generates a problem, particularly when it comes to video. If I want to run some video and have it sync uh, with my MIDI timecode, I can't do that like I can in some other sequencers, like I can in Ardor or Q Tractor, or, or even in MuseScore, the notation software. I can sync video to it, and then it's a lot easier to, to generate and create a, a film score kinds of projects doing that. Now, that's not a deal breaker for me, honestly, because I do things kind of the old school way. I, you know, 15, 20 years ago when I was doing a lot more film scoring for uh, student projects and graduate projects in, uh, in college, uh, I was doing it by using mathematical timings and making you know, uh, hit tracks that I would then uh, sync my music to, uh, and I still would do it the same kind of way. Uh, besides, I can still use notation software such as MuseScore to uh, um, compose my music with a video track that can be synced through the MIDI timecode there, uh, and then I can use that kind of uh, temp score uh, to bring into here as a MIDI file or, um, you know, in some other avenue like as, a, as an audio file with beats on it and then I can uh, sync my music in here to that so it's not a deal breaker for me I, I can still get around it and still use other methods to sync 
my uh, sounds in in here to uh, uh, video syncing. Um, besides, a lot of underscoring uh, these days is composed without very close syncing. Uh, there's a lot more, you know, freeform um, composition uh, playing into a MIDI keyboard uh, on a on a piano sound or a string sound, and uh, you know, working from there. And and because because it's all freeform, you don't really need the video syncing in the first place. You can merely play the video externally uh, and play in without your beat track going in the background and not in time uh, with the um, uh, quantized beats. Uh, and, you know, you can just export that audio and bring it into some other editor and, and sync it that way. So, uh, again, for the luxuries that it's missing, uh, it really makes up for that. And it's well-organized and in intuitive inputs and outputs uh, in the way that it is uh, so logical uh, to use. Uh, it's very clear-cut. Um, that's pretty much all I had to say about this new uh, kind of release. I have heard that some people are working on MIDI timecode inputs and outputs, so hopefully by the time they get to the final release of this, or to the 2.0 release, maybe we'll have at least um, uh, some kind of a MIDI output, timecode output, so that we can sync to video players or to uh, some other um, yeah, slave uh, software applications. Um, what I want to talk about now is making a template. If you're going to be using Linux Multimedia Studio as a uh, full-fledged MIDI sequencer, uh, you want to probably generate a template, and that's where the sound font package comes into play. Now, I've already created one, uh, so let me open this up here. Uh, I'll click here, File, New from Template, and I created this one called Symphonic 1. Um, and we'll open this up, and you'll see what it looks like, and I'll explain what I've done here, and you can do this on your own. What I have over here on the left is um, a single sound font player instance of all of the major instruments that I would use in a symphonic mock-up. So I have one instance of a flute, oboe, clarinet, bassoon, uh, horns, French horns, trumpets, trombones, and tuba. Uh, under the strings I have one instance of violins, not two, just one. Uh, one instance of violas, one celli, and one for the basses, and then for uh, some other uh, instruments here, key, keyboard or string uh, uh, type uh, instruments that fall outside of the, the normal string family and some mallets. I have a harp, piano, and a glockenspiel, or some mallet instrument. And then for percussion, I have an orchestral percussion kit, and then a timpani. Um, and these each in, in, involve a specific sound font uh, just for that instrument. It's a general sound font that sounds good. Uh, it might not be the one that I use in the final mix, but it's one to start with. Uh, and then what I can do from here is I can merely duplicate that instrument to have the right number that I want. And the benefit to doing that is that I have already have these instruments programmed into effects channels uh, with uh, preset effects. So I have my flute going into effects 3. Uh, into the woodwind slot down here, and on that slot I already have my reverb, my uh, initial reverb set. Uh, and I talked about this a little bit on previous uh, tutorials on my channel. You can take a look at that. Um, but this is a an, a an initial reverb that has the dampening all the way up and just kind of sets the instrument into a particular place in the room. Um, so it, it makes it sound as if uh, the instruments in this category are sitting at a certain place on the stage away from the microphones. And I've done this with all of my sections. And each section has uh, an initial reverb. And then all of those instruments are routed uh, into those sections. So I've already done that. So when I go to uh, duplicate this instrument, all of that routing will be in the duplicated instance. And I can just change the sound and it already goes where I want it to. Um, I also use uh, just a little trick that I use. I take an automation track and I put an automation track in front of, at the top of each one of the sections, and I label it. Now, I don't really use the automation track uh, for automation. I do use automation tracks, but I wouldn't use this one for it. This is just a label. It's a placeholder, uh, and it seemed like a good way to uh, kind of keep things organized and keep track of it so that I can have very quick reference when I look at my um, uh, left side of my sequence. Uh, so this is a template that I've made, um, just very quickly to go through some of the effects. Um, on the master, I have a compressor at the top uh, that gives me a lot of headroom uh, so that uh, 
uh, when I my final output is is fairly low, kind of in the middle of the output uh, channel here, and it gives me a lot of flexibility in my final render to um, normalize it or to uh, limit it in some way. So I have a compressor at the top, and then underneath that I apply a few different effects, and uh, very sparingly uh, in terms of the signal increase in signal output, uh, because again I want to have a lot of headroom. Uh, but I have a uh, reverb here that is a finish reverb that does have a little bit more of the um, decay time uh, on it, and it takes those very dry, um, I shouldn't say dry, but those um, uh, uh, reverbs that I have per section that don't have any uh, decay on them, uh, and then it adds decay to the entire mix. Uh, so there's a finish reverb on there. Uh, then I have also an EQ to, to kind of master that output a little bit, uh, it's just a four-band EQ. It, it boosts the highs uh, and the and the uh, basses, pulls back on some of the mids, uh, and gets it sounding a little bit more mastered. And then at the very end, I have uh, the stereo enhancer effect, and I just have it turned up about halfway. Now, what this does, I, I referred to this on a previous tutorial at the time. I didn't really understand what it did. I just knew that it worked pretty well. Uh, since then, I've learned um, this is what's called the Haas effect. Uh, and, and basically what it does is it takes a left and right stereo channel and it offsets the timing ever so slightly between the two channels. It might even also change the pitch a little bit. I know that you can do that uh, in some Haas effect um, uh, effects. Uh, it will affect not only the phasing in terms of time, a uh, very, very small amount of, of phasing, uh, but it will also change the pitch a little bit. Now what this does is it artificially generates the sensation that you have a very, very wide stereo feel. Uh, so I have this turned up, again, just halfway to add a little bit more uh, depth and width uh, to the final output. Uh, and I find that very, very useful in terms of generating realism from these MIDI mockups. Um, so I have this all set up and organized. Now what you can do uh, is you can create your template uh, with all of your instruments in it. Uh, and just very quickly you can hear you know what some of these these instruments sound like. So there's a flute with uh, some of that reverb on it. Um, down here I have uh, a yeah, piano. You can hear you know where it sounds in space. Uh, I have a uh, you know a general violin section sound. And then you can see these, these um, uh, sound fonts. Uh, if I look in here, you'll see that this is a string sound font from that collection. Uh, and in the string sound font, I have uh, compiled all of the my favorite uh, sound font samples, and they're even labeled. So these are the, from the Condensa um, uh, strings, and it's got the solo instruments in there. And then I have uh, some sections from the other ensemble uh, collections, like the St. James Orchestra and the Squid Font Orchestra. And there's a few, you know, different uh, instances of violins and, and, and violas and, and cello and basses. Uh, and I also have different uh, articulations in there. So these are all my favorites uh, from those collections, all put into one sound font. Makes it very, very easy. Uh, to load in and then replicate, uh, and then I can choose very quickly uh, between sounds without having to go find another sound font. Uh, I can just go through my patches rather than load a separate file. Uh, so I've done that with all these instruments. I uh, hear my trumpets, for example, and I've got all these trumpet sounds all put together, all in one. Uh, so different articulations, different instances of solo instruments, a couple of section instruments, a few um, uh, non-looped sounds that have uh, some articulations, forte piano, crescendo, uh, or a diminuendo, um, a couple of uh, instances of some effects, falls, a um, couple of mutes, um, some of these are ones that I made. Uh, I'm a trumpet player, so I actually recorded, I think, one of these. I, I made um, one of these solo instruments. It's on there uh, years ago, and I use it sometimes. Um, but anyway, that's how this is all put together, this uh, sound font package. It's very, very well organized, and I'm going to share it with you so you can uh, make use of it as well. Um, that's pretty much all there is to this template. Uh, what you want to do once you've made your template uh, is you want to save it. So the way to do that is you hit Save As, you find uh, your template's uh, location, and then down here you would select uh, the template file format, LMMS Project Template, MPT. 
Now, if you save it into your temple template folder, what that allows you then to do is when you go to your uh, new file uh, options, you can select new from template and your new templates will appear up here. And then you can select that new template uh, and it will load in uh, with everything uh, just as you have created it. Uh, makes for very, very easy startup on a new project because all those effects are in place and you can more readily hear what instruments sound like, uh, what you want them to sound like in the end. Okay, uh, so that was uh, what I wanted to show you about uh, generating a template, just some ideas on that. The next thing I want to talk about is some uh, orchestration tips. Uh, this is a little bit more in-depth talk on uh, some of the things that I have mentioned in the previous uh, tutorials in Linux Multimedia Studio. So I already have a file that I've created. Uh, let me open that up. Uh, and this file is uh, just a it's just, it's just a, a sketch that I, I made directly in the sequencer. Uh, and what I did is I played in uh, or clicked in you know, I played in f through a MIDI keyboard, but I also point and click, you know, in a few little parts here uh, into those very general uh, sound fonts that I had loaded. And then from there, I duplicated them and added the articulations that I wanted to use. So let me kind of give you this analogy. It's like painting. It's like painting a, a picture, painting using uh, paint, but you're stuck at the start with uh, just only tubes of primary colors. So, you know, you might only have uh, a red, a blue, and a yellow uh, to start. Uh, and the fact is, is just with red, blue, and yellow, and maybe some other pigment, white and black, uh, you can uh, create every color and the spectrum from that if you mix it properly. And this is a similar kind of concept here. We're starting with the basic elements. Um, we have... Uh, you know, these, these three different uh, parts to it where we have uh, the uh, attack, the tone, and the release uh, in different samples. So some samples might give you a very good attack on, on a particular kind of instrument, uh, an attack that sounds a certain way. Other samples might give you really good tone uh, on that instrument uh, that sounds at a, good at a, a particular dynamics. And then other samples might give you very good releases on that particular instrument at a particular tone. Um, very rarely are you going to find a sample that gives you everything that will work for every note in a passage. Um, you know, humans don't play that way. They don't sound the same on every note uh, at varying dynamics within the course of a two-measure measure passage. Uh, they sound different in every single note. So what we're doing here is we're mixing and matching some sound fonts in order to get the articulations we want, the attacks that we want, the tone that we want, and the release that we want. Uh, so let me talk about a few tricks here. Um, also related to that, you can use filters uh, to change those samples. Uh, for example, I might have uh, a, a sample that has a really, really good uh, uh, attack um, but I don't really want to hear uh, the low ends of that tone. I just want to hear kind of the, uh, the edgy or upper parts of the um, upper frequencies of that sound. I can add an, an, an EQ effect to that and EQ out the lower frequencies and just maintain the upper ones so that when the sample plays, I'm only hearing the parts I really want to hear. Um, likewise, I might have something that has a really, really good sound really, really good attacks, really good releases, but the you know, the timbre isn't quite right in the tone. It's maybe it sounds a little too bright, and I can darken that up by adding some EQ to it uh, and EQing out those lower frequencies, taking out some of the higher ones, and then it makes it sound a little bit more rich. Um, so you can add effects per instrument to make it sound the way you want, uh, and then mix that in with some other ideas. Uh, I might, uh, for example, down here I have a kind of a harmonic sounding uh, sound that you'll hear in a moment when I play this in the strings, in the upper strings. And what I did is I found a tremolo sound that sounded nice and shimmery, uh, and then a, a solo uh, string instrument uh, that sounded nice, and I put them together and I EQ'd them, uh, and then I added an additional reverb effect just to those instruments with a very, very uh, a large diffusion and very, very long uh, decay on it 
and it just makes it sound much more like a real harmonic being played on uh, string instruments, a specific way of playing that instrument. So I generated, I created using effects uh, the kind of sound that I wanted from the samples that I had available. So anyway, here is the um, track, and then I'll, I'll kind of pick out some little ideas here and talk about uh, principles in MIDI orchestration. So uh, thank you for waiting this long. It's almost been about... Uh, almost not quite 30 minutes here uh, and we're just now hearing some sound but there's a lot of theoretical things to talk about okay listen to this and uh, we'll talk about it Okay, so that's the um, that's the little sketch that I made here. Just a couple things about it. Um, there's really not much to this. I, I was just playing around with a couple of basic uh, ideas in, in a particular key. I think I'm in F here. Uh, and just playing around with a, a couple of different modes and... Um, you know, mixing some mixing some ideas together, very very simple theoretical things. Um, I have a uh, a pedal tone happening down here in the basses. It's kind of just sits in that one key, that one tonal center. Uh, and then I added in a uh, horn, uh, short little lick here that comes up again uh, over here again. We add a few more horns. Uh, that same lick. I think it doesn't happen anywhere else. It happens down here in the violas the second time. They double on it. And then I had a secondary uh, kind of response to that, which is in the trumpet. Uh, and then that comes back, and that also gets used up here uh, again in uh, some of the other instruments that we have in the woodwinds later on. Uh, and then down here I have a string sound uh, in the violins. It plays this kind of little counter melody uh, to that horn uh, little fragment there, and that also shows up again in the woodwinds. So just a couple of little you know, short thematic ideas put together uh, to make kind of a cinematic uh, sort of uh, sound. Something that you would hear, you know, in a, you know, the mist is rising over the battlefield uh, on the morning before the battle, uh, or, you know, maybe, you know, the camera is, uh, is, is rolling in to uh, Space Command and you see the great spaceship sitting there and you hear this kind of reflective music, that kind of uh, sort of scoring. So just a couple of little ideas here. Most of this was played in directly. Some of it was um, uh, point and click. So a couple things about MIDI orchestration and how, how to make it sound better. It's not merely about having good samples, and these samples are, are pretty well put together. Now, they're not any one of these samples is not that great. Uh, most of you probably have used these samples, these exact samples before, and probably have complained about them. Um, what is working here is the fact that I'm mixing and matching samples together so that I get, again, those three components to work the way I want them to per note. So I want the attack to be exactly the way I want it to be, I want the tone to be the way I want it to be, and I want the releases uh, to be very precise as well, the way I want them to be. So a couple of uh, things going on here. For example, um, up here, if you look at the woodwinds, 
I have, uh, for example, this oboe sound. It's a really great oboe sound. I can't remember where it came from. I think this might be the squid font oboe, solo oboe, uh, which is a really, really great collection. The problem with these sounds is that they're short. It's not looped, so I only hear a very short sample of the sound, uh, and then the sample ends. Now, the nice thing about them is that they have a nice decay on them. So what I can do is I can add a secondary version of this sound. Uh, so I have another uh, copied, a duplicated uh, version of the instrument, and I have a very generic oboe on there. In fact, this might even come from a general MIDI uh, sound, which by itself wouldn't sound very good. And this one is looped. I have the volume set pretty low. Um, in the effects, I have an EQ, a couple things about effects. Uh, one thing that I did in my template, I'll just point this out real quick, is I put a four band EQ on every single instrument and I generated sort of a high pass and low pass filter per instrument. So all of the upper uh, woodwinds and brass instruments got a high pass filter of sorts where I am cutting out uh, the low gain, um, in fact, entirely, and I'm keeping a, a little bit of the mids and then all of the highs. And the reason why I did this per instrument uh, in my template is, is that it, it really defeats a lot of complications that you have in your final mix and in mastering, where you have frequencies, in, frequencies interacting with each other in instruments that really shouldn't even be there. Um, so I, I created these uh, high and low pass filters per instrument. That's just a little tip for you to do uh, on the instrument effects. And you can see that um, uh, LMMS is very powerful in this respect, that there are multiple places in the chain at which you can place effects uh, that is very logical. I can put effects directly on the instrument. I can put effects in the effects channel that I'm outputting to, and then I can put effects on the master. Uh, and it's very simple, very automated, very logical. I can automate all of this stuff too by connecting to automation tracks. I actually use one automation track down here I'll talk about in a moment. Um, so I have that on there and then I have uh, another uh, EQ on there to accomplish a few uh, additional kinds of filtering. Um, I added one on here. This is an extra EQ for this particular sound. Um, that cuts out, actually does the reverse, it cuts out a lot of the high frequencies and increases the low end. And the reason is because I wanted to make this tone match my better uh, sample. And what happens here is that they're playing at the same time uh, and the gain is set low on my oboe tone, my very generic sound, and it's been EQ'd to kind of match better, so that when this sound terminates, when the loop ends, this one automatically picks up. And you can hear that uh, happening. If I solo that track and play it back, uh, starting right here, you'll, you'll hear how these two sounds work together. Um, yeah, that's, that's seamless. I mean, that is a seamless mix, uh, and that's what we're trying to do here. So I'm mixing and matching two particular elements. One is, is that I have one that has great uh, attack and tone, and then I have another one that's got a better uh, situation for release because it's looped, uh, and then I, I EQ'd the tone to, to match as best I could. Now, that took some thinking to do that, and it took a little bit of... Um, uh, a little bit of time to sort that out, but it was only a few minutes. I knew what I wanted, I knew how to do it, so I did it. Now one uh, very important thing is that the MIDI data between these two is identical. That's very important when you're trying to mix something, uh, two different sounds together to make them sound like one instrument. You want to make sure your MIDI data uh, lines up. However, when you have instruments in a section, you have multiple instruments performing something at the same time, such as down here where I have the trombones and tubas uh, on these attacks. You can look in here, if I go into my trombone sound, you see that my MIDI entry is a little bit late. Uh, the attack happens a little bit late, and actually in each note, there's two notes being played, one happens a little bit later than the other. It doesn't line up perfectly. 
uh, and I don't know if I entered it that way on the keyboard that way. You also see the velocity isn't identical. If you look down here, the velocity between the two notes isn't exactly the same. Uh, I don't know if I did that uh, automatically when I played it in or if I went back and I moved it. I probably actually moved the note over, you can see, a little bit. Um, and now here's a quick tip. What you want to do is on your quantization, set the um, amount to the highest amount that you can. So I have this at 164th, uh, 64th note value. Uh, and that seems counterintuitive when you're quantizing. Usually you want to quantize to um, the note values that is the smallest that you're using. So if the smallest note value that you're using is eighth notes and you want to quantize to that. I set it at the highest one so that you can make it less perfect because that's the goal in MIDI orchestration. I want to play in so that things are actually ending up at very tiny increments, you know, not, not so precisely on the beat, but just a little bit off. Uh, so that's the trombones are, are in that spot. And then if I compare to the tuba that's also coming in, the tuba is precisely on. And when you mix those all together, you'll, you'll hear that it sounds more human, that not everybody's entering it precisely exactly the same time. That is how it would normally be uh, with real human players. Um, so that's an important concept, that things don't line up perfectly particularly when you have sections of instruments playing. Um, coming back up here, let's take a look at some other instruments. I did a very similar kind of thing here with the horns as I did with the oboe. I have um, two different horn sounds, actually three different ones when I get over here. This one is more of a section horns. It makes it sound a little bit more uh, rich and robust when we get over here, like there's more horns playing. But then down here I have these two kind of soft sounds. One is a solo sound, and it's actually a trombone sound that I thought sounded more like a horn in this instance. And I often use this trombone sample uh, as a horn sound. And I even EQ'd it again so that it would uh, sound exactly the way I wanted it to. I took out the frequencies that I didn't want and I retained or boosted the ones that I thought were favorable. And then up here I have another horn sound that is a solo sound. I found that when I mix them together, uh, they made a pretty, a pretty decent, passable, kind of slightly out of tune horn sound. And, This is what we get. So this sounds like maybe one or two horns being played. If it's if it's one horn, it sounds like you're hearing some very interesting uh, resonance artifacts in the rooms. If it sounds like two, it sounds like they're not quite exactly in tune with each other, which is realistic. Uh, and then when we get over here to the uh, larger, bigger uh, uh, entrance, we can hear what this sounds like when we add the other um, sample. with uh, some harmony in their uh, secondary part, uh, and it sounds like it's now the section performing it. Okay, so that's another, uh, another instance where I'm uh, layering things up. The trumpets down here, um, I wanted to make one particular note change sound more authentic, and you'll notice that on uh, brass instruments, when you're moving from one note to the next, particularly within a harmonic series, um, you'll hear a little bit of a, a scoop uh, going from one note to the next, much like what you would hear on a string instrument as your fingers are moving uh, down the fretboard. Uh, you might hear a little bit of um, change happening between those two notes. So I put in one automation track, uh, and I automated that um, uh, pitch uh, bend there. Uh, the way you do this is that on the instrument, you can, uh, let me select the instrument here, you can take any knob or fader and match it up to a um, automation track. Additionally, if you right click on a, uh, a knob, like on the uh, pitch knob right here, I can edit the global automation. Now the problem with editing global automation is that you don't see it in the sequencer. Um, it is a separate um, kind of metadata that doesn't show up visually. Um, it's much better, I think, visually to create an automation track and then tie your knob to it. The way you do that is you press control, then you click, and then you can drag and then let go on your automation track wherever you want it. And that allows you a little bit more control and visual um, assessment of what you're doing. 
So I did that and then I went in here to the automation and I, I set my curve to where I wanted it to be, uh, this uh, particular kind of um, a curve, and then I set my points and I have this pitch bend. So here's what it sounds like with these uh, three different uh, trumpet sounds. You notice that one of the trumpet sounds doesn't come in until partway through the passage and that's because it gave me the articulation that I wanted at the end of that phrase. So here's what it sounds like with just the trumpets. Um, it's passable, I think. It sounds better when you have all the other instruments playing, but this is, uh, in full disclosure, what it sounds like. And by layering these up, you can hear that the trumpet sounds more like a person playing, that they get to the end of the phrase and the articulation and tone changes a little bit. Um, uh, later on, that same instance comes back with uh, another sound font added to it. Sounds a little bit more like uh, uh, multiple trumpets, and this is what we get. So that sounds like maybe there's an additional trumpet, maybe two trumpets playing now at that point, uh, playing that secondary line. Um, so yeah, layering these sounds up until you get it where you want it. No one sound, particularly on solos, is going to sound great with one sound font and one set of samples. And that's true of any uh, sound sample collection that you find, even the ones that cost, uh, you know, cost the big bucks. You're going to want to mix together um, your different articulations to make it sound authentic. Uh, so that's, um, that's that, that tip in action again here. Um, I'm trying to think of some other things that are very, very uh, useful. Copy and paste. Um, obviously, once I wrote something one time, I didn't need to compose it again. I could copy and paste that MIDI data. The one problem with that is that when you copy and paste, you want to take the time to go back and change um, your uh, uh, velocity differences so that you're getting different velocities and different notes the second time from the first so it doesn't sound so robotic and copied over. You also want to change your quantization somewhat so that it is not exactly the same as it was the first time. You want to move your your notes um, you know note by note to make it sound uh, like it's again human and a human would not play the same thing exactly the same way twice. It would be a little bit different the second time so you want to do that. Um, Let's see, what else do we have here? Uh, you, again, you want to use the sounds that sound right. You don't want to depend on the sounds that have the right label. The label means nothing. Uh, it is possible. This might be an extreme kind of case. But you might, you know, find an oboe sample that sounds remarkably like a muted trumpet uh, in a certain kind of passage. And, you know, just because it says oboe on it, I mean, that, that might sound weird, but it's true. Just because it says oboe doesn't mean that it has to pass only as an oboe. It might pass as a muted trumpet uh, in a particular kind of situation. So, you know, feel free to do that uh, and use that. Another example of that particular kind of thing, which I alluded to uh, earlier, is I have these uh, violin sounds. I have a tremolo violin uh, that sounds like this. And you hear that very long reverb on it. I wanted it to sound more like harmonics on a, a string instrument, so I added uh, to the effects channel, I added a, a reverb. It had a very, very long, drawn-out decay on it and a lot of diffusion. And then I, I mix that together with a solo uh, violin and uh, with the same effect applied to it, and now I have this harmonics kind of sounding instrument over here. So if I play that back, So this is the regular violin sound, and then you'll hear these harmonics come in over here. Very subtle. Very subtle effect in the background. Another thing I want to point out is um, a tip that I would offer is rather than depending on automation all the time 
uh, sometimes you can uh, do some tricky things just with your note entry and velocity settings. For example, I wanted this sound to decay more. So what I did is, I have a lot of effects on it, so it covers up this a little bit. But if you look at the MIDI data, what's really going on here is I have um, multiple entrances. So I have one entrance here overlapped with another entrance, overlapped with another entrance. And on each entrance for each one, and notice that they don't happen at the same time. They happen near the same time, but not at the same time. Um, the velocity setting goes down a little bit. So it, it, it decays via notes being entered in this low velocity plus the effects. It sounds like one note being played, but I'm actually getting my automation much more quickly and efficiently just by putting in multiple notes that are overlapped. Uh, so I'm cross-fading the sounds in a way um, by doing that, and it, it prevents me from having to put an automation track on there and tie it to a volume knob or something like that. So, you know, do things that are a little bit more quickly um, entered and more effective uh, rather than depending on automation tracks when you really don't need to. So that's a little tip. Uh, that I can share with you. Um, yeah, and that's that's pretty much it. You, you have to really spend time on the details in order to make it sound uh, precisely the way you want. And don't, don't be satisfied until you get it uh, as best you can the way you want it to, and then move on to the next instance and the next instrumentation. Uh, so start with the basic color palette, uh, and then move forward uh, from there and refine each color uh, using uh, different... Uh, layering techniques and filters to get what you want. One last thing on your template, you'll notice that I also have the pan set automatically for a lot of these instruments. So on the uh, original instrument, my flute is already set to pan at a certain place, and so is my clarinet. That's helpful for whenever I go to duplicate uh, my sounds and layer them up, that the pan also is part of that duplicated um, instance, and I don't have to reset any of that stuff and match it up perfectly. Um, so, you know, on your template, make sure everything is set really the way you want it to uh, so that it makes it easier on yourself uh, for later. When you're uh, composing music like this for media, for, you know, film score kind of, you know, uh, underscoring music, I highly recommend um, composing in a sequencer much more sparingly on instruments. You'll notice that not everything is playing all at one time. I'm not doubling up a lot. I only double up in one spot over here. Um, instruments are really featured by themselves. I depend a lot on soloistic performances. Um, I find that that aids a lot in the sellability, the realism, that verisimilitude of the um, uh, final render. Uh, if you are very sparing and sparse with your instrumentation, it's a lot easier to pass it off. When you have a lot of things going on, that's when things start to sound a lot more electronic because uh, sounds will mix down in very unusual ways, and it's hard to really control that um, you know, with, without putting in an awful lot of filters and, and having a lot of trial and error. So when you can... Uh, and you're orchestrating and rendering for, for media kinds of um, projects in, in a sequencer, keep it simple. Don't have a lot of things playing all at one time. Uh, that, that is very, very useful. Uh, little piece of advice there. Um, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll end with that. Just a few more thoughts on orchestration within a MIDI sequencer and demonstrating the fact that you know, LMMS is a fully-fledged, uh, fully operational uh, MIDI sequencer, just like anything else you would use, and you can render out very realistic, um, passable uh, examples using free sound fonts and just the uh, uh, plugins that are available right inside of the, uh, uh, the software as it is without uh, buying anything extra. So anyway, there you have it, Linux Multimedia Studio, a few more tips on um, orchestration, and um, I'm sharing with you that sound font collection, and I wish you the very best of luck with it. I hope that you find it helpful. Uh, I've also included in that uh, sound font collection, just to point out, uh, some of the vocal sound fonts that I made it, including the choir consonant sound font. So this is actually something that I made. Uh, I'm including it in there again, so you can have that uh, more together with uh, um, a grouping of these orchestral sounds. I also put in a folder 
of um, effects and synth sounds. A lot of these are from the Hammer Sound, uh, sound Font website, uh, Hammer Sounds, uh, and they are as is, so I didn't change anything about them. They're just a few different uh, synthesizers that are on there. Uh, so really, with this sound font package, uh, you can you could do pretty much anything and everything you ever wanted to do. Uh, everything is in there, uh, ready to be used. So, until next time, uh, this is Carl Irwin, and uh, wish you the best of luck.